Okay. Um, just to let you know, the session will be recorded and available for on-demand viewing. You'll be sent the link, so you'll be able to um, listen to the presentation if you need to go back and review that. And I'm going to introduce today's presenter, who is our TDM Program Director, Phil Winters. And so a little bit about Phil. I know many of you know him. He is the Transportation Demand Management Program Director here at Cutter, and he has 34 years in TDM research training and technical assistance. So he's going to teach you a lot of things about commuter benefits today. Um, his TDM team of eight researchers and support staff manage a wide range of TDM-related research and technical assistance projects and training programs. These research projects range from developing the TRIMS model to to predict impacts of TDM, to providing guidance on incorporating TDM into the land development process. So, Phil, I'm going to turn the time over, you, over to you, and uh, you can provide your presentation. Thank you, Julianne. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, again, good afternoon, everybody, and Happy New Year. This is the first Cutter webcast for 2014, so I'm happy to leave it, uh, lead it off. Um, <coughs> so what... Uh, what I want to do today is talk about um, kind of an intro to commuter benefits. This is a much smaller subset of some material we do as part of a two-hour training program, and it's really trying to be an, an intro for everybody. And I will point out that you'll see the image on this particular screen here is a brand-new document that should be on our website uh, this by tomorrow morning the 2014 Commuter Benefits Brief that will be on our bestworkplaces.org site. So uh, there's a link at the end for that particular website, too, so you'll be able to get access to that. Uh, of course, it wouldn't be right if, it, if I'm talking tax code if I didn't uh, have an initial disclaimer. Of course, we, we certainly advise you to seek professional guidance about tax law and interpretations from IRS. Uh, I'll do our, my best to try to describe the, the program and, and possible interpretations, but of course, uh, I, we're not representing the IRS. So the, the quick overview of what I want to really touch on, what are these commuter benefits or what the IRS refers to as qualified transportation fringe benefits? Who's actually receiving these benefits from a kind of a demographic profile according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics? And then also I'll leave not just like what are the benefits to the employers and commuters, but also kind of some of the benefits of, uh, that the employers can experience with trying to impl implement one of these, the type of flexibility that they have to help design it to fit their particular circumstances. So now qualified transportation fringe benefits is one of a variety of non-taxable fringe benefits that employers have access to. No additional cost services is one. You can think of that as, say, um, you know, you work for an airline and you can get a free ride, on, uh, fill an empty seat on an airplane. There's no additional cost to the, that particular airline to offer that benefit to employees. Qualified employee discounts, uh, you know, you work for a particular company and they have special discounts uh, that because you work for them you have access to. Working condition fringe benefit is an example of saying a, um, a you're, you're given a company car as part of your uh, your job. The minimus fringe benefits tend to be very small benefits that are generally not worth tracking. That might be, for example, having free coffee in the in the break room type of, type of deal would be a, an example of the minimus fringe. And in our world too, the transit and the transportation demand management and carpool vehicle world. Uh, you could probably lump emergency ride home, guarantee ride home programs as a form of de minimis. So they, they can be a little bit, depending on the distance, they, they can be a little bit expensive. And lastly is qualified transportation fringe benefits, where the commuter benefits is what we're talking about, what I'm talking about today. So now what are they? Under uh, Section, 20, uh, Section 132 of the Internal Revenue Code, um, it basically allows most employers – uh, stressing most that there are exceptions here, may provide one or more tax-free transportation benefits to employees. Again, emphasizing may. There's nothing that requires employers to provide these benefits, at least from the federal government side. 
So it, it, the employers may provide this. Now, what can they provide? Uh, right now, in 2014, they can provide up to $130 a month for transit and commuter highway vehicles. And I'll, I'll describe what a commuter highway vehicle is in a minute. And or they can provide a parking benefit up to $250 per month. Or they can reimburse up to $20 per month for qualified bicycle commuting. The and or emphasis here is to let you know that an employer has the, the ability to or can provide, say, a transit benefit and a parking benefit together. So in uh, they could receive up to three hundred an employee could receive technically up to three hundred and eighty dollars a month. However, they cannot combine the bicycle benefit with any of the other um, qualified transportation fringe benefits. So you either take, say, a transit benefit or a van pool benefit, or you take the bike benefit or a reimbursement up to $20 per month. Now, historically, what has happened in beginning in 1992, uh, prior, I'm sorry, prior to 1992, there was no limit on the amount of parking benefit an employer can provide. In 1992, it started at about 155 a month. They put a cap on how much parking an employer could provide to employees. In the top line, the reddish-looking line uh, that you can see, that's that's what has happened to that limit over time. So as of 2014, that limit for parking is 250. Now the bluish line uh, tracks the transit and commuter highway vehicle benefit over time, and you can see it's, they generally parallel with a couple of, uh, you, you know, large increases from one year to another. It jumped up to $100, $100 in 2002, and in 2000, <coughs> excuse me, in 2009, it jumped up to the same level as parking. Uh, in fact, it, uh, it dropped temporarily and then went back up to the same level of parking in 2013, which was 245. However, um, the parity element was was not continued. The Congress did not extend that con condition. This was a result. The initial one was the resi result of the, um, the stimulus bill, the ARA bill that actually created the equity. So right now, transit and commuter highway vehicle is dropped from 245 in 2013 to 130 dollars in 2014 and the biking benefit started in 2009 and has remained at 20 dollars since then okay now what, what's that commuter highway vehicle um it's basically it, the, the way it's defined is a highway vehicle with a seating capacity of at least six adults including the driver okay a seven passenger plus vehicle and, but at least 80% of that vehicle's mileage is expected to be for a move, you know, commuting between uh, commuting, and at least half the seats need to be filled uh, with passengers. So technically speaking, yes, generally we think of this as van pools, but technically speaking, there's some crossovers, for example, or large SUVs that would qualify uh, meeting the seven-passenger requirement. And again, you would not necessarily need to have a full vehicle you could get, uh, in case of a seven-passenger vehicle, if you had at least half filled, that would mean you need four people in that vehicle to qualify. So though technically the carpools are not eligible, a four-person, a four-person quote-unquote carpool in a passenger van or a uh, crossover, a large crossover, a seven-passenger crossover could qualify. And we talk about what are these interchangeably right now I'm using commuter benefits and qualifying transportation fringe benefits it's commuter benefits are usually easier to say than qualified transportation fringe but when we talk about transit we're talking about all forms of public transportation um, bus rail etc and on the commuter highway vehicle a variety of say van pools for example they don't have to be um, owned by the transit agency only to qualify for example it can be employer owned it can be employee leased uh, third parties can provide these. So uh, when we talk about what types of forms of public transportation, you can see there's a wide range. And this is just a sub uh, an example here. On the qualified um, bicycle commuting reimbursement, it's, it's actually um, 
the twenty dollar up to twenty dollars a month can be used for reasonable ex reimbursed and reasonable expenses such as the purchase of a bicycle, repair, um, and storage for the bicycle, for example. As long as the bicycle um, commuter is doing it on a regular basis between home and work. Now, so that means, for example, um, I imagine those those up in the north, in the northeast in particular, given the snow, that there may be people not riding their bike today that would normally ride. If that went on for the whole month, uh, they wouldn't be could and they didn't incur reimbursable expenses. They don't automatically get twenty dollars. So it's on a regular basis. Gym memberships uh, would not qualify. I sometimes get that asked, um, would that qualify as reimbursable? Our interpretation and discussions with others in, in, have come back to say, no, that would not. Uh, in, there are also ineligible travel options, including walk and generally carpooling. You know, again, the two- to three-person carpool in a you know, four or five passenger car, for example, would not are not eligible to receive any of these benefits um, for carpooling and and working from home too. There's no qualified transportation fringe benefit for the for those that work at home. Now, a couple important things to remember uh, when we've participated in some national research projects like this, we, we've did a lot of interviews with employers and talked to some of the and transit agencies, etc. It's important to remember, and, and we do get this question, too, from commuters, uh, commuters cannot go claim qualified transportation fringe benefits without employer assistance or involvement at some point. Now, this does not mean that the employer has to provide a subsidy or co-payment or underwrite the cost. Um, employees, employers can do that, of course. They can subsidize employees' parking, transit, et cetera, um, but they can also allow them commuters or employees to use pre-tax income to use their own funds to pay for parking, transit, and van pooling, but they can't use pre-tax for bicycle commuting, only for the transit, um, van pool, and parking. The other point to remember is we, is we talked to some employers initially when this came out that were being approached by uh, transit agencies and commuter assistance programs or TDM agencies to talk about this, that costs are um, they're deductible as a normal business expense, but these are not tax credits. Uh, to certain certain groups, employers were saying, well, they, we were told they were tax credits, and then when we got into it, they weren't. Now, that doesn't mean there are some states that may offer tax credits outside of this. I'm just saying that this is part of the Qualified Transportation Fringe Benefits. These are not tax credits, which would be a – think of that as a dollar, a dollar, dollar for dollar off the tax bill. Um, you can deduct them as a business expense. Now, what are some of the benefits that employers and commuters have seen? Uh, what we heard is it certainly it helps leverage corporate investment in benefits. They, they, dollar for dollar, they'll get a little, little bit more um, money going into the actual provision of the benefit than worrying about paying taxes on it if they do that. Uh, employers have cited um, that it helps attract and retain employees. You know, it's a... A best workplace, for example, to work. Uh, they've also noticed that it could, it fits consistently with things like their uh, sustainability images, what they're about. And from some employers that they rec certainly recognize among other benefits, it could reduce the need for parking and subsidizing parking costs for those that offer a transit and van pool option. The commuters, what it does often for most, for many commuters, if they offering transit and van pooling, and not just the parking benefit. It can offer more travel choices for them. It certainly can reduce their commuting costs if they use some of those options, especially if the employer is providing a subsidy or a co-payment, and um, can reduce their, uh, the taxes that they pay and you know, certainly keep them hap make them happier. So where do the savings come from? Well, from an employee, an employee can basically save in three areas federal income tax, state income tax, if your state has one, and federal payroll tax or Social Security, for example, or FICA. Uh, the employers actually save as well, especially with um, if they offer it either as a um, pre-tax or as a subsidy. But if they offer it as a pre-tax, in other words, they let their employees use their own money to pay for it and don't put up, you know, don't basically don't subsidize at all, they save on the payroll tax. And I'll explain that here. 
too. So there is a there is a savings that employers can benefit from, not just from the transit and van pool benefit, but also really from the parking benefit if it's offered as pretext. Now, <clears throat> what what this means is they pay no tax up to certainly no like payroll taxes or take in income taxes uh, on the value of the benefit up to the tax-free limit. And as we, as I explained in the beginning, there are now different tax-free limits for parking and for transit van pool. Um, now, an employer also, though, has a flexibility offering a benefit that is less than the tax-free limit. That doesn't mean, for example, you know, uh, you know, two, two years, several years ago, the we saw there that the parking, I mean, the transit benefit jumped from jumped up to the same parity as uh, parking. There's no need for that particular employer to match that. They are free to say, no, we're not raising our benefit at all, even though the, the limit has gone up. However, they can, you know, at the same time, in the case what's happening this year, where the tax-free limit is $130 per month for transit, they could continue to offer it maybe back what they were offering in 2013. They could still offer it, say, at 245 if that's what they were providing. However, that difference between the 245 and the 130 or whatever they were paying would be just treated as taxable income. Um, so the first 130 would be tax-free. But the employer has that choice. Uh, they may not choose to do that, of course, but they, they do have that choice. Now, this may be a little bit harder to comprehend quickly on a, on a short video, on a short presentation, but what we see here, for example, if you looked at it at three different ways of, say, offering the equivalent of $130 per month, the first, the first row here, for example, if, um, if we provide, if we provide, if the employer provided $130 per month in the form of a salary increase, um, um, it would cost the employer over the course of a calendar year, about an extra little under $1,100. They, they get a little bit of a tax break as a result of deducting some of this. So it costs the company to provide an employee $130 per month in the form of a salary increase, about $1,100. The employee, of course, would would gain, if they got $130 a month, they would gain um, – a big portion of that in actual spendable income, but of course not all of it would be spendable income. So that instead of the $1,560 they would get if, if it was a transit benefit, for example down here, they would only get about $1,285 as a result of having to pay payroll taxes, etc. cetera. Uh, if the employer pays the benefit, the transit benefit or parking benefit or the employee benefit, um, they would actually, what happens is it does cost them money, it costs them closer to $1,000, but you'll notice that it's dropped from about 1092 in this example to 1014 The difference is, is on this benefit, they're not paying the payroll tax of essentially 7.65%. Um, that's what they would have to pay up here. And, of course, if it was a transit or a van pool benefit or a parking benefit, the employee would get the full amount of 1560 There wouldn't be no deductions off the employee if it was offered as a transit or van pool benefit. And, finally, the third option is they could, again, the employer says, okay, I, I'm, I'm not going to put up a dime for you, but I'll allow you to deduct it as a pre-tax benefit. And it, for those that – um, wonder about this. It's fairly similar to things. It's kind of common, I guess, for employers that have parking that they may allow employees to pay that, but also like medical benefits and other things where the the cost of that service or the cost, say, for a transit pass comes off the top of your income, and then your then your taxes are calculated. So you get kind of the full value. The, the end result of this. Uh, again, for this $130 a month would mean over the course of a year, the employer would save, actually not cost them anything, even though they're not putting up a dime, would save them about $120. And the employee would end up with about $275 more in their pocket than they would as if they had to lay it out with after-tax dollars. So in a, in a sense, it's a form of a discount for a transit or van pool pass or parking for that matter. Now, who, who's actually receiving these? Now, the interesting, the, 
Yeah, on an annual basis, the Bureau of Labor Statistics does a national compensation survey, and this is the, the most recent one available in 2013. And the way this one, I've got a couple ways of looking at it. They have more detail than, than that are up here. Um, but the, if you look at from a wage earner point of view, the, those that are in the top 25% of wage earners, or average wage, are more likely to receive the benefit than those in the lowest 25% right down here. So, um, and if you look at the breakdown a little bit, you can kind of see, generally speaking, regardless that state and local workers, in particular state workers, somewhere on the order of about 21% of state workers have access to these commuting benefits. And I, I will emphasize access. That's what they're tracking. Just because they offer it does not mean that everybody's taking advantage of it. But overall, you're talking of more like 6% of the workforce has access to subsidized commuting. And subsidized commuting meaning really, for the most part, just transit benefits. It does not include parking. Um, a different way of looking at it based on employer size and, and type in terms of you know, civilian workers versus private industry versus state and local. Again, if you work for a larger organization of 500 workers or more, you're almost three times as much, uh, three times as likely to receive, uh, have access to the benefit as somebody in the one to 49 worker category. Um, so, it, and from a geography point of view, it it's relatively distributed or grouped in the kind of the northeast and far west categories are more likely to be offering it. Um, of course, those are generally areas with um, some of the highest um, transit use as well in some in New York City, et cetera. But again, it depends on the, uh, on the industry. State and local workers out in uh, the Pacific area are much likely to receive it than um, the same type of workers, say, in the South Atlantic, like here in Florida. Now, so what, what should uh, employers know? Um, again, employers are not required to provide a transit pass benefit, for example. There's nothing that says you doubt shalt do this at this point um, from a, a federal point of view. Um, it, again, the, but it does give the employer complete control in sense if and when to increase the benefit or change the benefit, I guess you could say, rather than just increase. Uh, they could decide that they wanted to decrease it for some, um, for example. The benefits, unlike some of the other types of benefits that are out there, are exempt from anti-discriminatory requirements. In other words, there's some benefits that, you know, they look at not only the, say, the highest paid pe people are getting this, they are free from that uh, under this section. They can give it to any or all employees. For example, um, maybe they have a, a group of a class of employees, a type of worker, for example, that's difficult to retain, they could decide um, we're going to only offer it to these employees. They could do it geographically, too. For example, they could say, okay, all of our workers in Atlanta will give the benefit to, but we won't give the benefit to anybody, you know, of our, all of our workers in Tampa. Um, they have that choice. They can vary the amount among employees. That could include things like, um, We'll, present, we'll provide, because the costs are higher, say, in New York City for ride transit than they are in Orlando, um, we might say we'll subsidize 50% um, of the cost in New York and 50% of the cost in, in Orlando, just use a percentage, or they could go, we'll give $100 in New York, which may cover, you know, a, less than 100% of the cost, uh, but $100 would more than pay, would would be more than necessary, perhaps, in a, a market like Orlando. <clears throat> and then they could provide even monthly or technically, they could provide monthly or, or even once a year if they wanted to. There are a variety of payment options. There are a variety of uh, third-party operators that actually, third-party benefit administrators, excuse me, that can provide these services for employers. Employers can do it on their own if they care to work with a transit agency, for example. And there's a variety of different ways of, of acceptance. And you see things like a transit check in the past and uh, various forms of debit cards and smart cards. There are, I'm not going to get into the details on those today. 
There is a one little issue that tends to come up when we talk to employers on the issue. Can we just do cash reimbursement? Can we just tell our employees, go buy the transit pass, come in and show us that you bought it, and we'll, you know, and reimburse you from your account? Um, if the, like, the, technically they can only do that if the pass or voucher is not readily available in that community. And that could, um, that could include, for example, um, uh, say you're a company of, of 25 employees and for some reason the transit agency only will provide vouchers and 100, uh, 100 ticket, uh, I mean 100 monthly pass blocks. That would not be readily available in a sense to that particular employer. But a larger employer, say 500 employees, uh, that would make it readily available. That's kind of a, an issue that where I think you might see trans, uh, some employers ask, can we just do that? They, they think it's a simplified way of doing it. Um, they can, <clears throat> other things employers can do, can do is actually kind of skipping down to the, a little bit to the third bullet. There, there are really no plan filings required there. There's no set paperwork needs to, official paperwork that needs to be filled out. It doesn't mean that it's paperless, but what may happen to the employer is they're used to implementing something with a lot of benefits with a lot of criteria and requirements and forms that need to be filled out. That doesn't mean they cannot follow that type of format for this type of plan. They have the flexibility of doing that, but they don't have to, don't have to do that. So I kind of suggest them to, you can use a similar payroll deduction mechanism for how you do cafeteria type plans, um, you know, they're uh, pick and choose what you'd like. Uh, you can require, unlike some other benefits, like a, say a medical plan, you may require, say, an annual election. Uh, we talked to one employer, for example, that didn't require any, you know, you know, enrollment, open enrollment period, and employees were coming in and out of the program quite quickly, and it increased their administrative head, overhead, so what they decided to do was go to, I think it was a a quarterly enrollment, so if you, once you signed up for one of the benefits, you were locked into it for three months. Um, that was a way to try to help manage the process. Um, but it does give you that flexibility to change it. You could could have made it monthly, you could make it every six months, whatever. Um, it, it isn't, um, and the last bullet, the no use it or lose it, unlike, say, a medical reimbursement account where you might set aside, say, a $1,000 for future medical experience expenses and maybe at the end of the, the year and essentially you've not incurred maybe $500 of expenses, uh, you risk losing that under medical reimbursement. You don't risk losing it here. So if you set aside, say, a pre-tax of $100 a month and then in August you go to Europe, so you don't need your transit pass in August, even though it's still deducted from it, it's still in your account. You can, you can draw down upon it later. And again, yeah, there's the emphasis is there's lots of flexibility available to employers to make this fit their situation, which makes it, I think, a little bit challenging because there are a lot of decisions that employers need to kind of make or, or consider when they're implementing these. Again, like the open enrollment period, what what should we do? What's the balance between what makes it best for our employees and what makes it manageable from our operation? Now, transit and TDM agencies also know. Now, remember when I, in the beginning I said it's, oh, well, it's eligible for most employers. There are groups that are not eligible. Um, for example, more than 2% shareholders in S corporations. Those are types of corporations where um, the income is protect, not taxed twice at the business level and the individual level. But they're not subject to this. So that they, they have another type of program. They have the original program, actually. So uh, from... From a transit agency point of view, part of the Transit Cooperative Research prod Program research, uh, which are one of the later slides here where the links to these reports are, um, there was, we looked along with uh, ICF Consulting, we looked at what transit agencies experienced with this and tried to look at existing surveys that were done and some data that we had from areas that had things like commute trip reduction ordinances. Overall, it seemed to be that agencies that, w that were talked to had saw that employers at the time that were offering transit benefits were a significant part of their overall system ridership and a big portion of their revenues, too. So both in, from a 5 to 25 percent range of ridership to 5 to 40 percent of their revenues. 
we looked also and said, well, where are these, what's happening with their, you know, say, prior mode? Are we just, are the only people getting benefit are the existing transit riders? Um, what we did see is that about 2 to 17 riders per 100 employees uh, were increased as a result of this. And uh, of the surveys that we had available, more than half of those new transit riders had stated they had, based on those other studies, had previously commuted by a single occupancy vehicle. So from the point of reducing traffic congestion, et cetera, it does, it does make a difference. And most transit agencies felt that fairly, the program was fairly successful. Um, there were some that just said it didn't, it, it took a little while to, it's taken to, it was taking a while to take root. And some of that was probably just trying to get employers to understand what this option was. It, it was survey, the report was done several years ago. So. Um, some closing thoughts so we can get to the any Q&As that you may have is um, don't oversell the tax savings to employers in particular. Um, the pay, they're saving on the payroll tax. It isn't cost-free in the sense that there are administrative costs that employers initially certainly have to do. Uh, the range of those costs were quite wide when we talked to employers. Some of them said, oh, we were able to do it rather quickly, and other, other, others reported a very long time of putting it into place. Uh, I would, this is my personal opinion, is if you just push employers to subsidize it, that's great, you know, if they're willing to do that. But uh, in areas where they don't have, they're not unwilling to subsidize or fully subsidize, getting the employer to allow employees to use pre-tax income to pay for, again, for transit and van pooling benefits is much better than nothing. It, it actually does get people to switch um, to that, but obviously if the employer's paying the freight, that you'll have more people change. But uh, you don't ignore that pre-tax is still um, an option. From a, what we found a little bit when discussing with some of the employers, um, it seemed like the transit agency was designing the program for what, what I would term their convenience. Uh, this is the way we do business, so the employers have to uh, abide by us. Like, do you have, do you sell passes in a way that's um, in, in essentially easy for the employer to distribute? You know, one consideration, for example, for some employers in some industries, say uh, the fast food restaurants, for example, we hire people, we'd love to be able to provide this benefit, but I don't know if this employee is going to be with me next week. Um, you know, the, the high churn over high churn. So if you're only offering it in the form of some, a monthly benefit rather than perhaps a proportioned weekly benefit, that may make that, uh, that employer unwilling to adopt the program. And kind of a, a plug for our other, one of our programs here to remind people that our best workplaces for commuters, and Julie's the project manager for that program here. But, uh, um, oh, actually, it should be best workplaces, <laughs> bestworkplaces.org, not commuterservices.com. But anyway, uh, that would help qualify an employer to be designated a best workplace for commuters. So that's, it's certainly a way to help um, promote, uh, you know, give, give attention, more attention to the employer. Now, here are a couple of the, yeah, here's it. Um, we have uh, on our Best Workplaces for Commuters Support Center, we have about 30-plus frequently asked questions about commuter benefits you can refer to. There's a Commuter Choice Certificate Program that, that we're, uh, as part of a two-hour course, to go a little bit deeper into this. The, the question I often get is on the issue, and probably anticipating one that might be coming, uh, is that, is anybody pushing to reestablish parity between transit and parking? Uh, there is certainly a group or a, a coalition called Commuter Benefits Work for Us, and the link is there. Um, you can read more about their efforts to try to, um, to um, and, and maybe get involved if you care to, to um, contact them. And that's another source. And then the final resources are the links to the two TCRP reports. One looked at the... Uh, kind of the employer aspects of it in the, number, the report 87, and the second one there looked at what were essentially the impacts on transit agencies of these programs were some of that later data that I had. So with that, I'll um, turn it back to you, Julie, for questions.
Okay, great. Time for the question and answer session. So again, you can type your questions in the, the Q&A manager at the top left uh, hand side of your screen. So if you have some questions, type those in. So Phil, there are questions coming in. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, let's ask, are there efforts to reinstate parity of transit and van pull to, to the same level of parking? Well, yeah, that, that that was what I was returning, uh, referring to on that commuter benefits work for us. That's there. There are efforts to do that. There are, um, and that's going on right now. The prospects. I'll I'll leave to somebody else to judge if if they're able to predict what Congress is going to do on anything. <laughs> so, but yes, there are efforts to try to do that. And and historically, this isn't the first time where the, the it's rolled the transit and and being pulled benefit has rolled back to a lower level than parking and then was reinstated. In 2013, for example, Congress took action to reestablish the parity and actually made it retroactive back to January 2012. So um, so it, it's quite possible that that may happen again. They certainly, the precedent is there that they have done it before. Okay, great. Okay, a member of our audience is wondering if a bike share membership would qualify. Um, it, that you know, it, I've heard I've heard a couple things. I've heard no um, being expressed. Yeah, I think it depends on the, the pri primarily the transit. I mean, I'm sorry, primarily the trip purpose, and certainly. Um, that it's being used on a regular basis. Okay, and I guess this next question is, is related because their question then again is, can employers subsidize bicycle commuters? An, an employer can provide uh, reimbursed to their employees uh, up to $20 per month for um, commuting on a regular basis by bicycle. Okay. So. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Another question from the audience, are U.S. employees employed abroad eligible for the pre-tax benefit? Um, boy, I, I'm never, I've not, in, I'm sorry I can't help you. Um, I've not heard that raised before. Um, good question. I'll, okay. Let me see if I can ask people. I know that there there are a couple other experts that are uh, participating as attendees, so I'll let let them see if there we can add a answer to your question. But um, sorry, okay. I, I don't have an answer for that one. Great. We'll uh, we'll do some research on that and yeah. uh, get back to that person and post that for everyone. Okay, so another question, let's see. Someone is asking, for example, their monthly bus pass is only $52. Seems like it's not worth pursuing with employers. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, well, I mean, yeah, I, I, don't, I would think that it would be. I mean, I think there are employees that are, if the employees are paying $52, they may not think of that as a trivial amount. And if... The employer is willing to help um, either allow them to use pre-tax or subsidize it. I think the employees would benefit. So from a commuter choice thing, I would definitely think that that's uh, worth pursuing. And to a okay. certain extent, I think historically they've some of the people that have been in this business and, and talking to employers and, and offering transit options, I think in the initial years found that actually the acceptance by in smaller communities or in smaller uh workplaces, um, there was a little bit more flexibility. So in a smaller, I'm assuming it's a smaller community too, so you might have smaller companies being willing to do this. It's a relatively low cost and certainly supports the sustainability efforts that many businesses would adopt. Okay. Um, let's see. Someone is asking uh, when you state regular basis, what do you mean by that? Can you elaborate? So what is considered regular basis? Uh, I guess I go the kind of the other way of interpreting it. You know, somebody who bikes once, you know, once or twice a month would not be on a regular basis. Something that somebody does it quite frequently. I would use probably some sort of frequency on that. Uh, I don't know if there's a. I haven't seen a hard and fast number, personally, about what is regular. But it's again, if you only do it one or two, 
twice a, once or twice a month. Uh, that would not be regular for that particular month. You could do it once or twice a month, say, here, um, in, you know, again, in Pennsylvania where it's snow and then and during the winter months, then doing it at 15, 15 20 times in the summer. Uh, so it'd be regular in the summer, but in not regular in the winter. Okay, great. And Phil, someone uh, gave their opinion on the foreign employees, who we know is an expert out there, and he says, regarding the foreign employers, there's really no reason why not. There's nothing in the legislation that prohibits. Of course, you know, as you mention all the time, consult your tax advisor. So that's a now that's answer a, back to that question. Right, and, and that's what I was wondering, assuming that they're they're still being – uh, subject to other U.S. taxes. I wouldn't mm -hmm. tend to think the same thing, but uh, it was an interesting question. I haven't heard that raised before. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you okay. to the person who responded. Yes. <laughs> okay. And, uh, okay, here's another bicycle benefit one. Um, why can't the bicycle benefit be combined with transit? Of course, it seems like a logical fit. And are there efforts to change this? Uh, on the first part of that question, um, it's it's the way it's included in the um, the code. That's to get. I think it was probably part of the uh, negotiations to get the bicycle benefit as part of of qualified transportation fringe benefits. Um, I'll leave it to others to to say if there are efforts to change this. I think the most of the focus right now that I'm, that I'm hearing is trying to get certainly transit and van pulling back on par with parking, um, but there's certainly a big group of people who would like to see the bicycle benefit, um, more flexibility, and certainly understand the issue of things like bikes, bikes on bus, bikes to bus um, options, too, that they could be combined, but as of now, they cannot be. Okay, great. Uh, another question. You mentioned that large carpools could qualify as commuter highway vehicles. Could you elaborate again? Oh yeah. Um, again, it it requires a basically a seven passenger vehicle with at least half full and being used eighty percent of the time for commuting. So conceptually, it could be done in a large a crossover or van that carried only four people if it was if most of the mileage in, in use was for commuting. Okay, great. Looks like we just have a couple more. Um, can my company use cash reimbursement? Um, the again, it, it, it depends on availability of rather if transit vouchers are readily available. If they are, they cannot use cash reimbursement. If they're not um, readily available, again, readily available could be there are no vouchers available. Um, so I mean. That would not make it readily available, or uh, there were some un strict, I mean, strict requirements that would be exceed what would be, I guess you might call it common sense. If I if I had to buy a hundred passes and I only had twelve employees, yeah, that would not be readily available for me as a work workplace. Okay, great. And Phil, so, um, just to know, there was another comment regarding the question on the uh, combination of the bicycle benefit and some of the audience. Just wanted to let uh, let you know there are efforts underway to change it. Congressman Blumenauer has led this effort. The coalition would like to see this included in new legislation. Uh, so just something else to add on to that uh, bicycle benefit combination sure. from our audience. Okay, well, uh, it looks like that's pretty much all of the questions for today, Phil. All right. Well, uh, thank you for um, your attention, and like I said, on – if you come back to bestworkplaces.org tomorrow, we should have that commuter benefits brief online for the 2014 and available for free download. So thank you. Okay, and so we're going to bring the evaluation up. And so if you could please take a minute to complete the online evaluation. This helps us to improve our program, and we're always looking for feedback. Um, and if you, could, if you want to provide any suggestions on future topics, that would be great. So, again, thank you very much for your attendance. And, again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact Phil or I at any time. Thanks, and have a great day.